Namaskaram. Today, uh, the question I'm going to deal with, it's a, a comment that was written on my blog a few days ago. Sorry, not on my blog. I mean, on my YouTube channel, on one of the recent videos, um, on a video uh, about how do grace, love and effort work together, complementing each other. Uh, not directly related to the subject of the video, but anyway, someone wrote a comment, and I'm sure many people re relate to this comment, so I, it's a longish comment, I'll read the whole thing and then I'll answer it. What this person wrote is, what I struggle with when it comes to Bhagavan's teaching of not trying to change the world and go within, is when it comes to close loved ones, when we see them suffering, is he saying not to help them? How do we reconcile his teaching to go within and not go without uh, when loved ones are suffering and in need of help? Plus, what is the best way to deal with loved ones who are suffering and you help them, uh, maybe in a way, in, in a way of financial way, and then you find uh, uh, they don't learn their lesson and need help again and again. Should we say no and turn within, or should we just uh, uh, help, even though we know they're not learning and um, not be attached to the outcomes? It's the same when we see loved ones suffering, and we may give them a different kind of help and try and speak to them about what is causing their suffering, like them chasing things, believing that it will make them happy, and getting themselves into a mess. Or we see they are believing their mind and believing they are the body um, if they have an illness or a specific mindset. If we try and help them by talking to them about why they may be suffering because we can see it and just want to help them, if we don't give help or do something, then we can be seen as not caring people close to us, loved ones, who don't follow the spiritual path and are suffering, often want something. They want to know you care. Even though when we give help, we see it as not really helping because they don't learn and they go back to doing the same thing over and over. Or they really, or they really not open to what you say even if at the time of talking to them, they say they understand, but they go back to their ways and get into a mess over and over and suffer all the time. How do we reconcile this? Because turning uh, inwards may, uh, may be ultimately the only way and fine for us, but for others who have no spiritual interest and just can't see any of this, they need help, need support. And if loved ones, if it's loved ones, it's not going, it, if it's loved ones not giving, it can cause us more issues because they can turn away from us because they feel we don't care or have no interest. How, to, how do we re reconcile these things? Should we still give the same help even if nothing changes long term? It may fix the problem short term, but as they don't learn, then they get back into the same mess. But should that be a concern to us? Should we just help regardless of whether they change or not? Or should we just do nothing and then accept the conflict that can occur because they feel you don't care? So should, uh, should we really just turn inwards and let uh, everyone sort themselves out it feels a bit harsh and in reality, not always easy. I think when you're, uh, when you're not understand what we, what, uh, when, when you're not understand what we understand and to just lead them to it and turn inwards and not help is a recipe for disaster in our relationships. If these people in our life are not only, are not only not on the spiritual path, but they, also, but they have no interest. It's like uh, it's like two alien. It's like two alien to each other. Uh, yet, if it's family, you have a bond, responsibility, usually a role to play. Any tips, please? So that that was the 
a rather long question. Um, I'll break it down into bits. Um, uh, the first question, when we see them suffering, is he saying not to help? No, Bhagavan never said not to help people. When Bhagavan said not trying to change the world, he what he meant is we shouldn't go outwards thinking that we can re reform the world, solve all the problems of the world, because we all know the world is it's the nature of the world to have problems. And even if you manage to solve one problem, other problems come in its place. So there's no such thing. We, we, <clears throat> we're chasing a, a, an illusion. If we think that we can um, rectify the world, we can make the world a better place. The world will always be as it is. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, we shouldn't help. If someone comes to us for help, um, it may or may not be appropriate to help them. That is that that we have to judge. But for, for example, if a if a hungry person comes to us and asks for food, if we have food, certainly we should share with them. I mean, we can see this exemplified in Bhagavan's life. He was kind to all, not only to human beings, but also to all creatures. And he treated everyone at their own level. Um uh so yes helping people when uh and there's no conflict between turning within and doing the the, the normal things that we would do to care for our family and for relations and those whether relations or friends or any acquaintance or anyone we come across it is natural for us if we see someone suffering to try and help them but we should also understand it's not always possible to help uh, so, as some of the cases this um, this person cited in their question, there are people who um, who maybe come to us for financial help, and if we give them financial help, they get into the same problem again. Um, and however much money you may give them, they still get back into the same problem again and again and again. In such cases, whether we should give them money or not give them money, we have to use our judgment. Sometimes, um, sometimes it's necessary. But, but sometimes the best good we can do for a person in such a circumstance or any similar circumstances is to let them experience the consequences of their action. For example, if a person is always being careless with money, and you're always giving them financial help, they never experience the consequences of being careless with money sometimes it's necessary sometimes the best thing we can do for someone is to let them experience the consequences of their action but there's no hard and fast rules we have to use our own judgment on a case-by-case -case basis Bhagavan didn't give us do's and don'ts he didn't say do this don't do that um, because Bhagavan's teachings are primarily concerned with being, not with doing. So what we are to investigate is our own being. Who am I? Um, the, the actions we do in the world, there are two the, the ac actions are done by mind, speech, and body. Because we as ego identify ourselves with this mind, speech, and body, we feel we are doing actions. But the actual actions are done by mind, speech, and body. These three instruments of action are driven by two forces. Firstly, obviously, we we are frequently acting under the sway of our vishaya vasanas. Um, that is, when we allow ourselves to be swayed by any vishaya vasana, our mind goes outwards. The outward movement of the mind is what is called uh, a vritti, a, a chitta vritti, a movement of the mind. So all um, so such movement occurs under the sway of our, because we allow ourselves to be swayed by vasanas. And um, actions of the mind give rise to actions of speech and give, uh, actions of body. So many of the actions we do, we do under the sway of our vishaya vasanas. But there are other, the, the, not all actions we do are necessarily driven by our vishaya vasanas. As Bhagavan explained, we each have a certain destiny. 
that is our prarabdha, what, what has been allotted for us to experience in this life, is already predetermined. So as Bhagavan said, what is, what is, not to what, what is never to happen, will not happen, however much effort is, uh, is made. And what is to happen will not stop in spite of any amount of obst obstruction. Uh, this is two of the sentences in the note that he wrote for his mother in December 1898. So things are going to happen as they're meant to happen. That each one of us have to experience the fruits of our past karmas, but not any random selection of fruit. Because we've, in the past, we've done so many good and bad and neutral actions. But, but, the fruit that we are to experience in this lifetime is selected by God in such a way that will be most conducive to our spiritual development. So what we are to experience, what is to happen to us, is already predetermined. In order to, to experience what we are destined to experience, certain actions are necessary on our part. For example, if it's a uh, our destiny to eat a tasty meal, we at least have to put the food in our mouth um, and, and chew it. So some action on our part is necessary in order for that, um, for that, uh, that uh, prarabdha, that, that, that destiny to enjoy that tasty meal, in order for that to happen, certain action is necessary. If it's our destiny, say, to become a doctor, we need to study and pass exams and so on we will be made to do those actions. So some of the actions that are done by uh, our mind, speech, and body are actions we are made to do by God in accordance with our prarabdha. That's what Bhagavan says in the first sentence of the note he wrote for his mother. Avarabha prarabdha prakaram adhikanavan angangindu artavipan. That means according to the the prarabdha, the destiny of each one, he who is for that, being there, there, will cause to dance. He who is for that refers to God or Guru, the one who has allotted the fruit of our past karmas for us to experience in this lifetime. Angangirindu, being there, there, implies being in each, well, it means being in each place, and therefore implies being in the heart of each one of us. And artuvipan literally means will cause to dance. It, it, that that's a that but but what it implies is we will be made to act in accordance with our uh, with our destiny, our prarabdha. That many people who read that wrongly assume that this means all the actions we do by mind, speech, and body are actions we are made to do by God. That is not what Bhagavan is saying there. Only those actions that we need to do in accordance with our prarabdha, we will be made to do. But many actions we do in accordance with our prarabdha, many actions that we are made to do by God, we are also doing under the sway of our vasanas. It's, it's, uh, it may be God, it, it, because it's our destiny to today to eat a tasty meal, we will be, uh, we will we will be made by God to, to chew and, um, and uh, to eat that food, um, to put in our mouth and chew it. But we also like to eat that tasty meal. So th that action is being driven both by God and by our vasanas. So just because an action is an action that we need to do in order to experience our destiny, doesn't mean that we are not um, responsible for that action, because to the extent that that action is also done by us under the sway of our vasanas, it is also an agamya. An agamya means those actions that we do in accordance with our will. In other words, the actions we do under the sway of our vasanas. So, in short, what that amounts to, what, what Bhagavan is saying there, is that whatever actions we need to do, uh, we're meant to do in accordance with our destiny, we will be made to do those actions. Over and above, and whatever, whatever is not to happen will not happen. Whatever is to happen will happen. We, however, though um, 
we cannot change what is uh, destined for us. We cannot, we cannot uh, avoid, we, we cannot experience anything we are not destined to experience, and we cannot avoid experiencing what we are destined to experience. We are free to want to, uh, to avoid what we're destined to experience and to experience what we're not destined to experience. We're free to want that. We are also free to try for that. So we have freedom of will. I think we're free. We're free to want anything we want. We also have freedom of action. We are free to act in accordance with our will. But we are not free to change anything. <laughs> However much we want to uh, something, and how much we try for it, we will not experience it unless it is our destiny. And if it is our destiny, we're going to experience it anyway. So what we should understand from this is, in, in that note, that, that is, I've, I've said what, the, I'll, I'll summarize the whole, I, I mean, I'll go through the whole note, because I've just been taking sentences here and there. In the first sentence, he says, in accordance with the destiny of each one, he who is for that, being there, there, in the heart of each of them, will make them act. What is never to happen will not happen, however much effort is made. What is to happen will not stop in spite of any amount of obstruction. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, we're free to make effort, we're free to obstruct, but we're not free to change it. And then he says, tinnam, this is certain. And then he concludes that note, he concluded that note by saying, Ahalin monomai irake nandru. Therefore, being silent is good. What does he mean by being silent? Does he mean that we shouldn't do any action? No, obviously, because he, he says in the first sentence, the actions that we need to do in accordance with prarabdha will be made to do. So it's not a matter of, of um, sitting like a log doing nothing. Uh, we, what we we cannot avoid doing those actions which we are made to do in accordance with our destiny. What he means by keeping silent is not rising as ego, because it is only when we rise as ego that we come under the sway of our vishaya of asanas and therefore do do actions under the sway of those vishaya asanas. In other words, do agamya. The, the actions that will later bear fruit and may later be experienced as prarabdha. So keeping silent means not rising as ego. And in order to avoid rising as ego, we need to hold on to our being. To the extent to which we hold on to our being, in other words, to the extent to which we are self-attentive, to that extent ego subsides. And to the extent ego subsides, it is not swayed by its vishaya vasanas. So, but so ideally, what we what we should be doing, we should be our only concern should be to attend to ourselves. Let Bhagavan make our mind, speech, and body do whatever actions they are meant to do in accordance with our destiny. Those actions we cannot avoid. But by clinging to self attentiveness, we are avoiding doing actions under our under the sway of our bhasanas. However, most of us don't have sufficient love to hold on to our own being um, firmly enough. So we're constantly allowing our attention to go outwards under the sway of our bhasanas. And so we are engaging in action. So when we allow our mind to go outwards, we see this world. We have a certain role to play in this world. We have uh, family, we have friends, we have job, we have so many different responsibilities and so on. But we should remember all these are for the person we seem to be, not for us. If we are following this path of self-investigation, by trying to hold on to our being, we are thereby separating ourselves from the person we seem to be. Not completely, obviously, but to the extent to which we hold on to self-attentiveness, we are thereby separating ourselves. So to, uh, uh, that should be our principal aim, trying to hold on to self-attentiveness. Holding on to self-attentiveness does not stop our mind, speech, and body. That is, us holding on to our self-attentiveness does not stop our mind, speech, and body 
doing those actions they are made to do by God. But because we we lack sufficient love to hold on to our being all the time, we are constantly coming out and constantly acting under the sway of our vasanas. So then we see the world, and the world is a complex place. Sadhuam used to say, as Bhagavan said, Atma Vidya is extremely easy. Atma Vidya means knowing ourself. That's what Bhagavan says in the song, uh, Anma Vidya. He's Bhagavan explaining why knowing ourself is so easy. So Sadhuam said, as Bhagavan said, knowing ourself is extremely easy. But living in this world is extremely difficult because there are all types of different people, different minds, different relationships. Life in this world is complex. There's no simple answer to that. That is so many questions are asked here, whether I should do like this, whether I should do like that. There is no simple answer. And if you ask Bhagavan, he will not tell you, oh, do this, don't do that. Um, we have to use our own judgment and try our best to act in this world in what seems to us to be an appropriate manner, helping people where help is appropriate. Maybe sometimes refraining from helping them when the help would actually not be a real help. If, it, if for example, if they are always getting themselves into financial difficulty, if we're always helping them out of their difficulty, we may be doing a disservice to them because we may be um, um, preventing them from learning the, the, from the errors of their ways. So how we should act in each case, we have to use our judgment. Sometimes we may be judging correctly, sometimes we may be judging wrongly. That doesn't matter. Our main concern should be holding on to our being. But since we, since we allow our mind to go outwards, we seem to be faced with dilemma often. In in uh, in uh, Sanskrit and Tamil and other Indian languages, this is what is called dharma sangadam. That is a, a a dharma dilemma, basically. That is, should I act like this or should I act like this? If I act like this, it will have such and such an effect, some good effects and some bad effects. If I don't act like that, it'll have some other effects. So it's often very very almost impossible for us to say in many situations, what is the best way to, to deal with situations? And we need to recognize that our, our own inability to solve problems. If people, if people have problems, if they, um, I mean, they, various things are mentioned here, people who, have, who keep on getting themselves into financial difficulties, ultimately that's their own making. Whatever we do, we cannot change them. Sometimes helping them is, is sometimes we may be thinking we are helping them, but actually making things worse by perpetuating that habit. Likewise, with people who a lot of suffering, as this person who asked this question indicated, a lot of suffering is because of people's attitude to the world. They think they can get happiness from this or from that. So they're always hankering for these things and trying to achieve them. And because if they're very trying for these things, it is causing them suffering. So it, it, we may feel inclined to give them advice, to tell them, no, Happiness doesn't lie outside; it lies only within you. You're you're just um, you're chasing shadows. You're not going to whatever you uh, achieve in a material sense. Nothing is going to satisfy you. We can give them good advice like that, but in all probability, if they have no inclination to this towards this spiritual path, they will not. Um, they will not appreciate what we say, we, um, we say to them. So in some cases, even though we may be able to give good advice, if we know that advice, advice is not going to be heeded or not neither heeded nor appreciated, it is best to keep quiet. Um, there's a, in, in, um, in talks with Ramana Maharshi, one of the uh, things that is recorded there, not very accurately, but there'll be some, it, it'll be the gist of it, is 
what when um, there were court cases put against the ashram by a disgruntled devotee called Paramal Swami and a group of people who were behind him. Paramal Swami was claiming he was the right, he was the original manager of the ashram in Skandashram days. And so he was the rightful manager of the ashram. And so he was trying to claim the right to be manager of ashram and he was putting court cases, not only against the ashram management, but also against Bhagavan. So um, a summons came for Bhagavan to appear in court. But because some devotees who had some influence um, appealed to the governor of uh, uh, Madras, as that in those days Tamil Nadu was called Madras um, presidency or, or whatever, uh, appealed to the governor, and the governor um, gave an order that the court should come to Bhagavan. So the, the, the court came to Bhagavan and questioned him. And one of the things they were questioning about is about um, how the ashram is accumulating. Um, it started off from nothing uh, some 10, 15 years ago, and now it's become a big place with so many buildings and everything, how all this wealth is being accumulated. Um, so they asked Bhagavan um, about this, and um, uh, Bhagavan said, I I told them not to collect money in my name. They don't like to listen to what I have to say. I don't like to give ineffective advice, so I keep quiet. So we should follow Bhagavan's example. If people are not going to listen to our advice, there's no good, there's no use giving them advice. So Bhagavan told people in the ashram not to use his name for collecting money. But in their enthusiasm to um that is, Raman Ashram is, though it has the name of Bhagavan and it grew up around Bhagavan, the ashram was built not for Bhagavan, it was built by the devotees for the devotees. So because they people wanted a nice convenient place to come and stay and in order to see Bhagavan and everything, many devotees contributed towards the building up of the ashram and um, some asked people particularly for donations can you help us we uh, we've got this building to do that building to do will you help us that was not you know according, that was against the advice of bhagavan but because they didn't listen to bhagavan he kept quiet there's no point in telling people to do what they don't want to do so we sh we can apply this here there's no point in talking to talking to people about spiritual matters if they are not um if they are not willing to see things in that way this is another thing we can learn from bhagavan bhagavan of his own accord never gave teachings to anyone if no one had asked him any questions he would not have said anything he he the teachings he gave were only in answer to questions because um so we shouldn't we shouldn't tell anything about um about bhagavan's teachings or bhagavan's path to others unless they ask us we shouldn't of our own accord go out and tell them because for the majority of people they they they're not attracted to this spiritual path they won't want to hear these things they view their life in quite a different way my problems are now because i don't have what i want so in order to solve my problems, I have to get what I want. That's their attitude. Our attitude, when we give them, uh, if we want, if we get, if we want to give them advice, our attitude would be: the problem lies in wanting it. Don't want it, and your problems will be solved. But it's so they're not ready to view things from the perspective from which we're viewing them. So there's no point in us giving advice to people. So. Um, when we see people suffering, we may we may understand their suffering because of uh, what they're doing or what they're seeking or what they're um, dissatisfied about or whatever it is. We can't change that. We can't change their mindset. So we we have to show kindness and concern, but we shouldn't uh, think that we can solve their problems by giving them advice or telling them how sh they should view things. If they ask us. And if we see that they are receptive, we can tell them about Bhagavan's teachings. But most people, even if they ask us, they are, what they want is something different. If they don't want to hear what Bhagavan has taught us, 
They, they don't want to change their attitude from a worldly attitude to a more spiritual attitude. There's no point in, in telling them what we know they're not going to um they're not going to understand. This is or, or accept. This is another thing we can learn from Bhagavan. If we read books like talks or so many other books of conversations with Bhagavan, we can see Bhagavan is talking to people at their own level. Bhagavan will not give advice or spiritual guidance to someone if they are unwilling to follow it. So often many of a lot of the answers we can read in books like talks are not the pure teachings of Bhagavan. Firstly, they're not recorded very accurately, but even apart from the issue of the inaccurate recording, even what Bhagavan actually said is often not his real teaching, but he had to adapt his teaching to suit the needs of individuals. When um, it, Another thing that's recorded in talks, when Yogananda, the, the, the Swami who, uh, who went to America and started the Self-Realization Fellowship and wrote the book, An Autobiography of a Yogi, um, in, sometime in the 1930s, he came to Bhagavan for a brief visit. And one of the questions he asked Bhagavan is, what teachings should be given for the uplift of the masses, or something to that effect? And Bhagavan said, teachings cannot be given en masse. Teachings should be according to the taught. So often what Bhagavan answered to people's questions was not his pure teachings, but he because he knew they wouldn't be willing to accept his teachings in their pure form. So he had to he had to present it in a diluted way that would be palatable to them in order to slowly, slowly draw them to his path. So there's a lot we can learn if we pay close attention to, to Bhagavan, to how Bhagavan acted in this world, we can learn a lot from it, how we should behave in this world. Um, Bhagavan was kind and uh, caring to all people. But sometimes if people came um, with certain difficulties and started putting their difficulties before Bhagavan, sometimes he would just keep quiet. He, it would be as if he wasn't even hearing them or he wasn't caring. Some people found it difficult to understand why this person's suffering so much, why Bhagavan is not uh, is, is just keeping quiet, why he's not saying anything, because Bhagavan knows what is the appropriate thing to do. Um, Chadwick, for example, say, uh, records in his book, but um, sometimes when people with mental illnesses came to Bhagavan and um, uh, everyone expected Bhagavan would would help them. Bhagavan seemed to be completely indifferent. This is not in all cases, but in some cases. So why is that the case? We cannot say. We don't know what's going on. But um, maybe Bhagavan could see that their problems were of their own making, and but whatever he would say would not be effective in changing that so he kept quiet anyway we 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 can't always understand why bhagavan acted or didn't act and he acted in the way he did or um, why in some cases he didn't uh, respond at all we cannot understand obviously bhagavan is seeing much deeper than we are seeing so uh, we are seeing only the person on the surface whereas bhagavan sees deep into our heart so however bhagavan responds to us is the appropriate way um so about all the questions here a lot of things a, a lot of moral dilemmas dharma sangadam that we face in life there's no simple answer. You should do like this, you should do like that. We have to use our judgment for better or for worse. Our judgment won't always be correct. Often we'll make mistakes, but we have to do what seems to us to be the best thing. That's all that we can say. There's nothing more than that. But the most important thing to bear in mind, that is this question, a lot of this is asking, should I do like this or should I do like that? Bhagavan has has talked about this in uh, Nana, in the 13th paragraph, which is the paragraph which is specifically talking about surrender. He says there's one sentence, which if we understand it correctly, is actually a great assurance to us. Um, 
well, the whole thing is a great assurance to us, but um, in the third sentence of this paragraph, he says, since one Parameshwara Shakti is driving all Karyas, uh, instead of we also yielding to it, why to be perpetually thinking it is necessary to do like this, it's necessary to do like that? Is what Bhagavan means, what, what he refers to as Parameshwara Shakti. Parama means supreme, Ishwara means Ishwara means God, but God is the ruler. So Ishwara also means Ishwara Shakti also it means the power of God, or it also means repeat, ruling power. Because God is the ruler of this universe in that sense. So since that one divine power, basically, we can say that one power of God is driving all karyas. What does he mean by karyas? Karyas here means whatever needs or ought to be done or to happen. So what, as Bhagavan said, what, what is never to happen will not happen. What is to happen will not stop. However, so things are happening as they're meant to happen. And the things that we need to do or ought to do, we will be made to do by him. So when such is the case, why should we, instead of yielding ourselves to it, in other words, instead of surrendering ourselves, instead of subsiding back within, why should we be perpetually thinking it's necessary to do like this, it's necessary to do like that? We should leave all, what we should do, how we should do it, ultimately we should leave that to Bhagavan. Because there are many situations in life where it is not at all clear to us how we should act. But we will be made to act as we are meant, uh, as, as in accordance with what is meant to happen. So, if a certain relative of ours is meant to get constant financial help from us and to continue spending and wasting their money, if that is what is destined to happen, we cannot avoid that even if we want to. So, when it comes to it, we we may tell ourselves, "No, this time I shouldn't give them money," but. Something will prompt us to give. We'll feel sorry for them. We, 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 we feel we're not able to say no, and we'll be prompted to do so. So, whatever we, whatever we ought to do or need to do, we'll be made to do. So, we really need not concern ourselves with these questions. Yes, of course, as a general rule, we should be kind and caring to all people. We should show concern. We should help where help is appropriate and possible. But often people are in, in problems and we, we are not in a position to help them. We don't, have the, we don't have the answers to all problems. We can't solve our own problems. How can we solve other people's problems? But whatever help we are meant to give them, we will be made to give them. Um, and if we if we're meant to not give them, we'll be even if we want to give them, we'll be prevented from giving them. So ultimately, we do not need to concern ourselves with all these things. Our only concern should be to turn within, hold on to our being, and thereby surrender the whole burden to um, to Bhagavan. In this context, I think. The whole of this, um, I've read the whole of the note that Bhagavan, I explained the meaning of the whole note that Bhagavan wrote for his mother. Equally applicable in this circumstance is this the whole of this 13th paragraph, which is the, the central topic of this paragraph is about surrender. So I'll just go through the meaning of this paragraph and then let my answer rest at that. Uh, what Bhagavan says in the first sentence of this paragraph, he gives a definition of what is surrender. How can we surrender ourselves to God? How can we give ourselves to God? He expresses it very, very beautifully. He says, being Atmanishta Paran, giving not even the slightest room to the rising of any thought except Atmachintana, alone is giving oneself to God. So what does he mean by being Atmanishta Paran? Atmanishta Paran means one who is firmly fixed as oneself. We are firmly fixed as, as, as ourself. Ourself here means our real nature, what we actually are. We are fixed as that to the extent to which we subside. So being Atmanishta Paran means subsiding back within, not rising as ego. And how we can be Atmanishta Paran is implied in the 
first clause, the, the adverbial clause, which in English comes second, but in Tamil it actually comes first. The meaning of that clause is giving not even the slightest room to the rising of any chintana except apma chintana. Chintana means thought. So apma chintana literally means thought of oneself. It implies meditation on ourself, contemplation on ourself, or self attentiveness. So the implication of this clause is we need to be so keenly self attentive that we thereby gave no rise, room to the rising of any other thought. That is, thoughts arise only to the extent to which we attend to them. Without our, since thoughts arise in our awareness, if we attention is allowing our awareness to go towards something. So if we withdraw our attention from the thoughts, they cannot, there's no room for them to rise. So when he says, giving not even the slightest room to the rising of any chintana, except Abma chintana, the implication is being so firmly self-attentive that we thereby don't allow our attention to go outwards and thereby give no room to the rising of any other thought. So in other words, clinging to self-attentiveness so firmly that we give no room to the rising of any other thought, and thereby being as we actually are, that alone is giving ourselves to God. So in this sentence, Bhagavan clearly indicates, ultimately, the only way, though we may be able to surrender ourselves to a certain extent before we come to this part of Vichara, ultimately, our surrender can be completed only by means of Atma Vichara. Because what is the self we have to surrender? It's ego. The nature of ego is to rise, stand, and flourish by grasping things other than itself. So turning our attention back towards ourself uh, to try to see what we actually are, in other words, self-investigation or self-surrender, by that, to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, ego will subside, and to the extent ego subsides, we are, that is, the subsidence of ego is giving ourselves to God. So um, that's a very, very beautiful definition of surrender there, and shows the, the ultimately surrender, the, though often Bhagavan said there are two ways, either investigate yourself or surrender yourself. Here he clearly indicates that ultimately we can surrender ourselves, our surrender of ourselves can become complete only by means of Atma Vichara. So, the, so Atma Vichara and self surrender, in, in, the, in their deepest sense, they are one and the same. That is, we cannot attend to ourselves without thereby surrendering ourselves. And we cannot surrender ourselves. We can surrender our will, at least to a certain extent, we can try and surrender our will, our likes, dislikes and everything, not my will, but your will. We can try and surrender our will to God. We can and we should try and surrender our will to God. But we can never surrender our will completely without surrendering ourselves, the one whose will it is. Because the very nature of ego is to have a will of its own, to have vasanas. So if we are to surrender our will completely, we need to be ready to surrender ourselves completely. And to surrender ourselves, the only means is Atma Vichara, as Bhagavan makes very clear here. Then many people uh, may object if they hear this sentence, oh, Bhagavan expects us not to give room to rising of any other thought. But how is this possible? I've got so many responsibilities. I've got a family, I've got children, I've got husband, I've got wife, I've got elderly parents I need to take care of, I've got a job, I've got responsibilities at my job, I've got so many responsibilities. How can I, uh, how is it possible for me not to uh, give rise to any thought? Bhagavan answers that in the next, Bhagavan anticipates that objection and answers it in the next sentence, in which he says, even though one places whatever amount of burden upon God, the entire amount he will bear. What that implies is we can surrender everything to Bhagavan, to God. We can surrender our mind, speech, and body, everything we surrender to him. Then it, if we have surrendered our mind, speech, and body to him, then it is for him to make this mind, speech, and body do whatever actions are necessary 
for the fulfillment of all the responsibilities and uh, duties of this person. So our own, all we need to be concerned about is turning within and holding on to Bhagavan in our heart. Bhagavan in our heart means Bhagavan is ever shining in our heart as our own being. To the extent to which we hold on to our being, we are thereby surrendering ourselves to him. And he will anyway make our mind, speech and body do whatever they need to do. Um, so we we need not feel I have so many responsibilities. I have to do this. I have to do that. That I is the problem. Uh, what we need to do is turn within and subside back within. To the extent that that I subsides, everything will happen perfectly as it's meant to happen. Whatever actions of mind, speech, and body are necessary, they will be made to do anyway by God. Whether we surrender ourselves or not, he's going to make our mind, speech, and body do what they need to do. So we can surrender the entire burden, all our duties, all our responsibilities, Leave it to God. He will make us do whatever, whatever we need to do. And that then follows on very nicely to the next sentence, which I read. Since one Parameshwara Shakti is driving all karyas, when he says he, that one Parameshwara Shakti is driving all karyas, that means that one Parameshwara Shakti will make our mind, speech, and body do whatever they need to do in order to fulfill all the duties and responsibilities of the person whom we now seem to be. So we can surrender everything to him. So because he's anyway making everything happen as it's meant to happen. So since he is driving all carriers, instead of yielding ourselves to it, why should we be perpetually think thinking it's necessary to do like this, it's necessary to do like this, like that. That implies we shouldn't be constantly uh, worrying ourselves, should I do this? Should I do that? Leave it all to Bhagavan. Let him go, make us do whatever, uh, whatever we should do. So our only responsibility is to is to surrender ourselves to him by clinging firmly to self attentiveness. And to illustrate what he says in this third sentence about the Parameshwar, uh, giving every, yielding everything to the Parameshwara Shakti. He gives a very beautiful analogy, an analogy I'm sure we're all familiar with. Though we know that the train is going, bearing all the burdens, why should we who go traveling in it, instead of remaining happily, leaving our small luggage placed on it, like placed on the train, suffer bearing it, our luggage, on our head? That is, if we're traveling in a train, the train is carrying all the burden. The train is carried carrying our luggage. So there's no need for us to, to suffer carrying our luggage on our head. Carrying our luggage on our head is futile because the train is anyway carried. Even if it, the luggage is in our head, it's still being carried by the train because the tra train is carrying us. So we can happily put the luggage aside, put it on the seat or in the luggage rack or wherever, and we can travel at ease. So any suffering we undergo in this life is suffering we have brought on ourselves by not surrendering. If we, to the extent to which we surrender ourselves, we thereby can travel through life happily. Bhagavan particularly uses the words in this sentence. He contrasts um, uh, in, uh, um, Instead of putting our small, instead of remaining happily, leaving our small luggage placed on the train, uh, remaining happily means is sukhamiramo. That means instead of being happy, putting our luggage on the train. Um, so sukham means happy. Happy. So what Bhagavan Bhagavan doesn't want us to suffer. We suffer. Our suffering is of our own making by carrying the burden on our head. So in the in the next clause he says, um uh Ade Namadu Talail Tangi Kondu Ain Kashtapada Vendum. Why should we suffer? Kashtapada means to suffer. Why should we suffer carrying it on our head? So ultimately we need to understand any suffering we undergo in this life is ultimately of our own making. 
because we have not surrendered ourselves. If we surrender ourselves, the same things will happen, the same difficulties will come and everything, but we will not suffer as a consequence of those difficulties because we it's all we've left it all to Bhagavan. Our only concern is to turn within and subside back into our heart. And in this context, it's worth um, remembering what Bhagavan said in the very final paragraph of Nanao, which is also, uh, this is such an important paragraph. He says, Tanerandal Sakalomum Erum. If oneself rises, everything rises. Well, if oneself rises here means if we rise as ego. So if oneself rises, everything rises. Uh, Tam tan adanginal sakalam adangam. If oneself subsides, everything subsides. So we need to understand Bhagavan's path is, is all about subsiding, all about withdrawing back within, sinking into the heart, not rising as ego. That is what Bhagavan's path is about. To the extent to which we subside, we are thereby surrendering ourselves to him, and thereby we are like a, a um, a passenger who travels happily on the train, leaving his luggage, his or her luggage aside. So if we suffer, it's only because we've risen as ego. If we want to be free of suffering, we need to cease rising as ego. And we can cease rising as ego only by clinging firmly to self-attentiveness. And then in the next sentence, this is a, uh, it's difficult to, um, there's one particular word in this uh, sentence which is difficult to translate adequately in English. Tandu. Ta the verb tar means to um, to uh, sink low or subside. So tandu means sinking low or subsiding. So he says, "Evlo kevlo tandu nadikaromo, avlo kevlo namayundu." To be to whatever extent we um, we we nadikiromo means literally means we walk. That means we we go through life. We uh, behave. We conduct ourselves. Um, so to whatever ex extent we go through life, subsiding, sinking low, avlo kavlo nammayundu. To that extent, there is goodness. In other words, this is Bhagavan's, in effect, Bhagavan's definition of goodness. Goodness exists only in subsiding back within. To the extent to which we subside, to that extent it is good. To, to the extent to which we rise, that is bad, because we and others suffer as a consequence. If we want to be free of all suffering, and if we don't, we don't want to be a trouble for ourselves or for others, we need to subside back within. The greatest good we can do to the world is to subside back within. Um, and then he ends with a, a sentence, Manate adaki kondirandal enge irandalum irakalam. That means um, if one is a, a restraining or curbing mind, wherever one may be, one may be. Um, when he says, uh, restraining or curbing mind, he means not rising as ego. So curbing the inclination, our inclination to rise as ego, to, if we are able to, uh, if, if we are constantly uh, curbing the rising of ego by clinging to self-attentiveness is the implication. Uh, wherever one may be, one may be. It can also, this final clause can also be, wherever one may be, let one be. It, it can, irakalam can either mean one can be or uh, let one be. It can be taken either way. So Bhagavan's teachings are all about subsiding back within. How we should act in this world, let us leave that burden to him. Our concern should be to turn within and subside more and more and more. To the extent to which we leave the burden to him, he, whatever way our mind, speech, and body acts, will be the way they are made to act by him, so it will be the appropriate action. So this is Bhagavan's advice for how we should live in the world, by subsiding more and more within. So if we want to do good to ourselves and thereby do good to all, 
we should subside, subside, and subside. That is what Bhagavan's teachings are all about. So, um, sorry, that was a rather long explanation, but I hope that was helpful to people. Because this, this question that this person asked, this, these are questions many of us ask. Because Bhagavan hasn't given us simple do's and don'ts. Do in such and such circumstances, do like this, do, don't do like that. Bhagavan has, teachings are far deeper and subtler. But one advice Bhagavan has given us is whatever the circumstances, whatever the dilemma you face, surrender yourself, subside within by clinging to self attentiveness. And then whatever happen, whatever is meant to happen is going to happen anyway as it's meant to happen. And whatever you, your mind, speech, and body need to do, they will be made to do. In other words, we need to surrender our, our mind, speech, and body. We need to surrender ourselves completely to him. Surrendering ourselves entails surrendering our mind, speech, and body to him. So does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask on this? Um, there are two questions here, Michael. Yes. The first is um, when there is oh, sorry, when there is trauma and complex trauma, wherein the mod, wherein the mind and body both are involved, how can the self, the I am, still remain the witness? That is, when the self witnesses the mind to quieten it, there are traumatic triggers from the past that the body responds to, and thereby triggering the emotions disturbing the mind, and hence making it difficult to remain the witness. And trauma treatment through psychological therapy seems a symptomatic treatment, and I don't see it protecting against the future traumas. Um, firstly, this term, the witness, this is a much misunderstood term. Bhagavan has clarified that the term witness, Sakshi in Sanskrit, it is used in two distinct senses. When Sakshi is in, used in the sense of the knower of all this, that which is aware of all this, that Sakshi is ego. It is only in the view of ego that all these things are happening. Everything happens only in the view of ego. In the view of the self, as you call it, or our real nature, um, nothing is happening. There is just pure being. That is the, the nature. Of what our real nature is pure being, pure awareness, and pure being. Pure awareness means awareness that is not aware of anything other than our being. So. Uh, Whatever trauma we may undergo, we are. That is the one thing that is constant in our life is this fun is our being, this fundamental awareness I am. This is unaffected by whatever may be happening, whether the mind is in a calm state or an agitated state, whether we are facing trauma or whatever whatever be our external circumstances, the one thing that is constant and unchanging throughout all three states, waking, dream, and sleep, is our own being, I am. So the, the, we always remain as I am, is the truth. But now it seems to us that that is the truth is, I am. That is the only thing that actually exists. But now, when we when we rise as ego, we are aware of ourselves as I am, but we are not aware of ourselves as just I am. We are aware of ourselves as I am this person. I am Michael, or I am whoever. Um, the trauma that we face is trauma for the person. That is, the person we now seem to be may have gone through all sorts of experiences that may have caused all sorts of trauma. That is for this person. The path Bhagavan has taught us, the path of self-investigation and self-surrender, is about separating ourselves from this person. So to the extent to which we turn our attention back within and hold on to our being, we are thereby separating ourselves from this person and thereby separating ourselves from everything that is 
pertains to this person. So the trauma is for this person that we seem to be. So by holding on to our being and thereby subsiding back within, we are separating ourselves from this trauma. So um, to the extent to which we hold on to self-attentiveness and thereby surrender ourselves, we are, we are cutting at the very root of trauma because trauma is for whom? Only for ourselves as ego. But if we cling to self-attentiveness, this ego subsides and we thereby separate ourselves from the trauma. So ultimately, the, as you say, the, the, the therapy and these things, I, sometimes it may be appropriate to go for therapy because sometimes we, we may be in such a traumatized state, such like we take um, medicines for physical illnesses. We, it's, um, it, as, Bhagavan, as Bhagavan said, the, the disease comes according to prarabdha, the medicine also comes according to prarabdha. So we shouldn't think, oh, I surrender everything to Bhagavan, therefore I shouldn't take medicine. That is not surrendering to Bhagavan. If Bhagavan gives us a medicine, that is, the medicine comes, we take uh, the medicine. So likewise, just like we take uh, medicines or therapy for physical conditions, it may also be appropriate to take medicines or therapy for mental conditions. That may be appropriate. So, I, um, I, but the the all these therapies, particularly the therapies for the mental condition, they may help, but they're helping on the surface. The solution Bhagavan has given us is a much deeper solution. It's cutting at the very root of all these problems. So the best thing, we, we are not just to remain as imagining that we're Romania as a witness. That is not what, that is many people are misunderstood because this term witness is used in, uh, so many of the older texts, people think, oh, I have to witness everything. But, but that which is witnessing in the sense of experiencing all this is ego. So we are not, and we may to a certain extent be able to detach ourselves from things by just being, uh, uh, imagining that we are a calm witness, we are not affected by these things. That may have some therapeutic effects, but that's not going to take us very deep. If we want to go deep, we have to stop witnessing anything outside. We have to, what do we have to witness? We witness in the sense of attend to, we have to witness the witness. Observe the observer. Attend to the one who is attending. In other words, we have to turn our attention away from everything else back towards ourselves. To the extent to which we do so, we will thereby subside and separate ourselves from this person and its trauma. That is the most effective treatment for the trauma, subsiding back within. As Bhagavan said in that last paragraph of, of um, Nana, to the extent to which we go through this life sinking deep and sinking low to that extent it is good sinking low means being very humble it, but not just being humble it's it's subsiding back within to the extent to which we're subsided back within we will be free of the effects of that trauma um so this is ultimately the the, the best solution to trauma but if we're in a very traumatized state our very, our very trauma may make it seem to us to be difficult to hold on to self-attentiveness. Why does, why does it seem difficult for us to hold on to self-attentiveness? Whether we're traumatized or not, for most of us, holding on to self-attentiveness seems to be very difficult, even though Bhagavan has said it's actually the easiest of all things. Why does it seem difficult? Because we don't want to do so. So, but, but as Bhagavan said, bhakti is the mother of jnana. L love is the absolute key. We will succeed in this path of self-investigation and self-surrender only to the extent that we have love to subside back within. So we, when we are faced with trauma, but trauma is a type of, it's, it's a subtle identification. I have had traumatic experiences. I am experiencing trauma. By turning within, we are separating ourselves from, we are breaking that identification because the trauma is, the, the, the trauma seems to affect us because we identify ourselves with it. But, and the root of all identification 
is ego itself. That is, ego is the as ego, we are always identified with a person. Because we're identified with this person, we are also identify with the experience this, this person has been through. So if this person has been through very exp traumatic experiences, I have been through traumatic experiences. That is a wrong identification. Bhagavan's teachings are cutting at the root of that identification. So Bhagavan's teachings are the perfect solution to all these problems, um, whether trauma or whatever problems we may face, Bhagavan's teaching of a solution. But how much we can apply that solution depends upon our love. Are we willing to hold on to our own being and subside back within or not? If we are not willing, we can't, if, we, if, if we're not willing to take the medicine, if we refuse to take the medicine, we can't blame the medicine. It's we who are, so if we, if we really want to be free of trauma, the best way to be free of trauma is to hold on to our own being, because our own being is ever unaffected by trauma, whether whatever experiences we may have been through in the past, pleasant experiences, unpleasant experiences, traumatic experiences, whatever it may be, but one thing that is constant and unchanging is our own being, I am. So by holding on to that, that is our refuge. That is the refuge from all the troubles of life, from trauma and every other imaginable trouble for, of life. But the, the refuge from all of these things lies in our own heart, in our own being. By turning back within and subsiding within, we are taking refuge at the feet of Bhagavan, we are, we are, we are, uh, we are surrendering ourselves to Him, taking refuge in His, at His feet, in His grace, and thereby separating ourselves from all these problems. I hope this is a a helpful answer to that question. But if the person who asked it would like to ask anything more, in this connection. The next question, we learn from sleep that there is no awareness of the body in the world. There is only the awareness I am. Does this also mean that if I am not aware of someone or something in the waking state, not thinking of an object, it does not exist in that moment? In other words, it only exists if there is an I, an ego, who thinks or experiences them. Yes, that, that, that is the truth. According to Bhagavan, all the only thing that actually exists is Atmosarupa, the real nature of ourself. In other words, our own being alone actually exists. All other things seem to exist only in our view, only in the view of ourself as ego. So uh, things exist to the extent to which our attention goes, uh, goes out to them. So if we are not thinking of something, Strictly speaking, it does not exist. If it's not in, if it's not in our mind at all, it doesn't exist. Because everything seems to exist only in, in our mind, in the view of ourself as ego. In a dream, only that portion of the world that, um, that is, we, in a dream, we imagine we are a small person in a large world. But the world we know is only the world of our immediate experience. The rest of the world is just an idea in our mind. Oh, there's a vast universe out there. So it seems to us when we're dreaming, but that vast universe out there is just a thought, as indeed is what we are seeing in front of us. So everything, that's why Bhagavan said, the whole world is nothing but thought. If we remove all thought, there's no such thing as world. The world is just a series of mental impressions. So anything in the world exists to the extent to which it exists within our mind as a mental impression. The only thing that actually exists is ourself, our own being, our own existence, I am. I hope that adequately answers that question. The next question is, uh... Could you elaborate a bit more on why can't we remain in the self? 
Um, is there something to be done to remain? We all can remain in the self. Remain in the self means subside and be as we actually are. We all can do that if we want to do. If we want to subside, we can subside. The reason it seems difficult for us to subside is because of our reluctance to subside. So the only difficulty in this path of Atmavichara is our lack of willingness to let go of everything else and to sink back into our heart. As Bhagavan said in Anma Bide, this is actually the easiest of all paths. So any difficulty we perceive in this is only difficulty caused by our lack of willingness, our lack of love to surrender ourselves completely, to subside back into our heart and just be as we actually are. We are, we, we are so attached to this identification, I am this person, and all that this person experiences, we are not willing to let go of it. That's the whole problem. That's why Bhagavan often emphasized love is the absolute key in this path. We cannot succeed in this path without all-consuming and heart-melting love just to know and to be what we actually are. Would you like to talk a little bit about... Um... Yeah, so um, I can ask a question. Um, you were saying that um, that uh, strictly speaking, when we're not attending to objects in the world, to vishayas in the world, uh, uh, then they don't really exist. So I suppose the follow-up question really there is that in what sense do they come to exist and how do they come to seem to exist for us? Yeah. I'm sure that that's a question everybody... Okay, they don't really exist, even when we're experiencing them. They only seem to exist. And when we are not experiencing them, they don't even seem to exist. So we, we all have the impression that we are living in a vast universe. There are so many, um, not only this little planet we, we, we live on, which seems so big to us, but it's actually very little in compared, comparison to all the, the, the solar systems and galaxies and other planets and everything. So there's a vast universe out there. Where does that vast universe exist? It exists only in our own mind. It's just an idea in our mind, but there's a vast universe. So nothing has any existence. Nothing has any existence at all. Things seem to exist, only to the extent to which we are in one way or other aware of them, even if our awareness of them is just a thought. So, for example, the Big Bang, where does that Big Bang, uh, uh, where does that Big Bang exist? Um, it exists only in our own mind. When did that Big Bang occur? At the moment we think of it, it didn't do, that is the idea of this Big Bang occurred so many billions of years ago. That is also just a thought in our minds. So everything is just a mental impression. As Bhagavan says in the, um, in the um, verse 6 of Uludunapadu, the world is nothing but the five, the world is the, the five kinds of sense impression, nothing else. That is, there's no such thing as world. If we remove all sights, sounds, tastes, smells, and tactile sensations, there is no such thing as a world. And the, so this, this, all these sense impressions, they are mental impressions, because it's a mind that, is, that has the impression where, where I am seeing this, I am hearing that and everything. So it's all only in the mind. That's why Bhagavan says in verse 26 of Uludhanaptu, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Ego itself is everything. Therefore, uh, investigating what this is, is giving up everything. That is, why does he say, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence? Because everything, here meaning all phenomena, all objects, they exist only in the view of ourself as ego. 
So when we when when we don't rise as ego, they don't exist at all. So in sleep, in which we don't rise as ego, there's no mind, no body, no world, nothing. There's just pure being. In waking and dream, we rise as ego and we dream all this. We we dream the semi existence of all these things. But all these things are just mental impressions, just thoughts. Just like the whole dream world is nothing but our own mental impression. There's no, there's no dream world out there, but we, it seems to us so long as we're dreaming, but we're a little person in a vast world and the world exists out there. So it seems so long as we're dreaming, as soon as we wake up, we recognize, oh, it was all only in my own mind. Why? What, why, what was a moment before seemed so real, suddenly we recognize it's unreal. What, a, what change has taken place to enable us to recognize it's unreal? The reason the world, the dream world seems real is in a dream, we always experience ourselves as a person in that dream world, as a body in that dream world. Because what is actually real is only ourself. When we experience ourselves as I am this body, this body therefore seems real. Because since I am real, if this body is I, then this body is real. So the, I, our identification with this body is what makes this body seem to us to be real. And since this body is a small part of this va seemingly vast universe, the whole universe seems real. So, so long as we are dreaming, the dream world seems real. Even if we, if people say, oh, but what about, um, um, what they call it, uh, um, lucid dreaming. In lucid dreaming, you may have the thought, this is all a dream, but it still seems very real to you because you're identified with a dream body. So long as we identify with a dream body, the dream body seems to be real. And because the dream body seems to be real, the whole world seems to be real. But as soon as we wake up from a dream, our identification switches from that dream body to this dream body. So we no longer experience that dream body as ourself. So immediately on waking up from dream, however real that dream may have appeared to be to us to be a moment before, when our identification with that dream body is severed, when we cease identifying that dream body as I, we at once recognize, oh, it was just a mental projection. It wasn't real. It was just only in my own mind. But now this world seems so real because I'm identified with this body. So what is actually real is only ourself, only I am. Because we are aware of ourselves as I am this body, the reality of I am is thereby superimposed upon body. And because body is a part of the world, the whole world seems to be, because the body seems to be real, this body cannot be real and the rest of the world unreal. So because this body seems to us to be, the body seems to us to be real because it seems to us to be I. Because the body seems to be real, the whole world seems to be real. So though this is all just exists in our own mind, it seems so very real to us. Does that adequately answer your question, Shalini? Yes, I think <laughs> so. Yes, I guess uh, the only thing was that, um, which I think you are addressing is that, which I'm sure other people are also thinking is that the world is, of course, just made up of sense impressions. Without the sense impressions, there is no world. Uh, yes, there is yes. no solidity and... Uh, or heat, or uh, all these are impressions. All these sensations, uh, yeah. and then the feelings that come after that, uh, pain or fear or whatever, they yeah, all yeah, arise yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, in yeah. connection with that. Um, so then it becomes that. Well, then what is the nature of uh, of these mental impressions? Uh, of course, uh, which is perhaps something one can only really know experientially, if we uh, simply um, the more we so to um, investigate ourselves the more we come to see the the transparency or the yes. sort of uh, the non-real existence of yes. these things their yes. insubstantiality that is mental impressions are impressions experienced by whom only experienced by us so they, that is the, the mind 
but is impressed by these impressions is our self, is, is what we now take ourselves to be. So it's only when we write, it's only in the view of ego that all these impressions seem to exist. And the same ego that is experiencing these impressions, the body is also just a series of impressions. But because when we rise as ego, we take this body to be ourself, so the body seems to be real, so all our impressions of an out external world also seem to be so real. So, so long as we are taking us, so long as we are dreaming, in other words, so long as we are experiencing ourselves as a body, the world inevitably seems to us to be real. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, the next but if question... we want to know what is actually real, where does the world and bodies, where, from where do they derive their seeming reality? That is, the, the, the seeming existence of body and world derives, that is, the body and world derive their seeming existence only from the seeming existence of ourself as ego. And from where does the ego derive its seeming existence? Only from the real existence of ourself as I am. That is such it. That is what we actually are. Such it means um, existence awareness, pure being, pure awareness. That is what we actually are. Everything else derives its seeming existence only from this. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, Charlene, you were about to say something. No, no, I was just thanking you. Uh, I'm moving on to, I think that was very clear. The next question is, I'm not absolutely clear about what is love. Traditional love is always related to attachment. So if we talk about love for the I am, in my mind, it sounds like attachment. Uh, there's a verse in, um, in Tirukkural, the Bhagavan often used to refer to. Tirukkural is a, is a, a classical Tamil uh, work. In that verse, it is said, um, it, it, I, I'm not quoting it exactly, but it means something to the effect. In order to be free of attachment, be attached to that which is free of attachment. So normally we would take that to mean the one who is free of attachment is God. So if you want to be free of attachment for all other things, be attached to God. But that God who is free of all attachment is actually our own being. So ultimately what that verse means is, if you want to be free of attachment to all other things, be attached to yourself. And that is, yes, we, we are inevitably attached to whatever we love. But rather than being attached to anything other than ourselves, which creates a dependency, if we are attached only to our own being, we subside back into our being and remain as our being. So it's not, it's not one thing being attached to another. It's being attached to ourself as we actually are. One thing about love, but um, many people fail to understand. For example, most theologians, particularly Christian theologians, but I imagine the theologians of most religions, um, would argue that love is always for another. So uh, love is meaningful only when God is other than you, then you've got love for God as, as another. Bhagavan points out the very obvious truth in the first sentence of uh, Nana, for what do we all have the greatest love? We all love ourselves more than we love any other thing. So love, it, it is a, it is a, it is a, it is a wrong idea to think that love has to be for another. The purest love is love, is self love. Self love means not love for the person that we now mistake ourselves to be, because this person is something other than ourselves. Love for ourselves as we actually are. Love for ourselves as pure being. That is love for God, because God is nothing other than that pure being that we actually are. Um, the next question is, in Bhagwan's poem, The Marital Garland, he says, 
when you threw mud at me, I'm not sure how accurate the translation is. What is the meaning of that? Thank you. He didn't say threw mud at me. He put, he said, um, who was it who put mud in my mouth? Putting mud in, in the mouth is a, it, it's a Tamil expression. It, it ruined me is what it means. Uh, but what he means by ruin me is ruin this ego. Well, the next question is, is it safe to say that all-encompassing love is lack of limitation? Yes, yes. That is, when there's no limitation, then there's only one. And the state of perfect love is the state of perfect oneness. If you really love something, you want to be one with that. So if we really want to be, if we really love God, we don't want to be separate from God. So long as we rise as ego, though God is always our own being, we seem to separate ourselves from God by rising as ego, because we seem to limit ourselves. So if we, if we, if we want to, uh, if we want to, truly love God, we need to, we need to give ourselves wholly to God so that there's no separation at all between ourselves and God. When there's no separation, then there's, that is infinitude. Because the infinite can always only be one. If you, if you have two infinites, then each infinite is other than the, the, than the other one, and so both are limited. So the very nature of infinite has to be one and because god is infinite he is one he's not only one he is the one he's the only one and so we cannot be uh, we cannot be separate from god but by rising as ego we are seemingly separate from god so we need to surrender ourselves to god we need to give ourselves to god in order to merge back in the one that alone actually exists Uh, the next question is, uh, my friend just, sorry, my friend just returned from a funeral for a mother and daughter killed in a recent missile strike in Liev. Kiev, Liev. What consolation can Advaita provide in such a situation? It seems almost cruel or immoral to assert that war and death are but illusion when confronted with such stark and drastic realities. Thank you. That is what <laughs> that is one of the central themes in the Bhagavad Gita, particularly in the first second chapter of Bhagavad Gita. That's what Krishna is talking about. That is life and death, birth and death are for whom? It's only for the body. It's the body that is born and the body that dies. Yes, life is very cruel. Whether we are going to die in a war or in a famine or in a pandemic or um comfortably in our bed at night. Death is absolutely, if we are born, we will certainly die. So death is inevitable for all of us. How that death occurs is according to our destiny. Um, yes, life is very, very cruel. That, that is wars, pandemics, starvation. Um, <clears throat> that is, if we look at the world, there's so many injustices. War is obviously an injustice, but there's so many other injustices. We live in a world where some people have vast, vast wealth, hundreds of billions of dollars, and other people have nothing. So there's so many injustices in this world, so many things, but this is the nature of the world. The world is never a perfect place. And um, so we, we, this is samsara, this is the nature of embodied existence. If there's embodied existence, we are always vulnerable. We're vulnerable to disease, we're vulnerable to accidents, we're vulnerable to warfare, we're vulnerable to pandemics, we're vulnerable to starvation, we're vulnerable to so many things. So this is just the nature of life. But there's something in us that, is, that was never born and will never die. That is our own being. 
that is what the spiritual path is all about, separating ourselves from this perishable body, which is inevitably going to die sooner or later, whether in a war or whatever the circumstance, we don't know the, the circumstances of our death, because that's all, our death is always in the future. Um, when it happens, we won't be there to know about it. So um, uh, death is actually just the ending of a dream. So um, yeah, this is, this is a waiter is providing the solution for this. But if we, if we, if we don't take an Advaitic perspective, then we are doomed to be born and to die. And because the birth and death is for the body, and what and we who take ourselves to be the body are ego, though body dies, ego remains. So ego will have, but is now dreaming this life, will dream another life. So the, this birth and death will go on. This is why it's called samsara. Samsara means it's, um, well, there are various different um, explanations of samsara. One of the meanings of samsara is samchara. They're well moving. It's constantly changing, 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 changing. See this body that was once a, a, <clears throat> once young and um, running around playing. Now it's slowly becoming older and getting more creaky and getting more ailments and everything. But it's inevitable. The body, the body changes. Everything changes. Nothing in life remains unchanged except for one thing and one thing alone. I am. It, it is I who experienced myself as a small boy so many years ago. It's now I who experienced myself as getting towards the end of this life. Um, it's I who experienced waking. It's I who experienced dream. It's I who is that the one constant through everything. The sleep was also that I is continuing. So this is the only thing that is permanent and unchanging and self-shining, that is, I shines by its own light. It doesn't depend on anything else. Everything else depends, of, exists only in the mind, so it depends upon the light of the mind, and the mind depends for its light on I am. So <clears throat> Bhagavan used to say, the definition of reality is eternal, unchanging, and self-shining. The only thing that is eternal, unchanging, and self-shining is our own being, I am because it's constant through there's never a moment when we are not aware of ourselves as I am um it never undergoes change change is all for what we take ourselves to be they change for ego ego comes into existence and it subsides it comes into existence in waking and dream it ceases to exist in sleep so ego is changing and everything else exists only in the view of ego and is also everything is changing so the one constant is um, the one permanent thing is our, our own being, I am. That is why the first qualification for following the, this spiritual path, the path of Advaita, is said to be nitya anitya vastu viveka. Nitya means what is permanent or eternal. Anitya means what is impermanent. A vastu means the substance, and viveka means the um, the, the discrimination, the ability to distinguish. So we need to distinguish what is permanent from what is impermanent, because only what is impermanent cannot be real. Only what is permanent is real, and that is our own being. So, so long as we rise as ego, we take ourselves to be a body, and so we are liable to be killed in war or to lose our loved ones in war. Wars are happening all the time. That is now very much in our consciousness because it's happening in Europe. In a um, is is this war in um, in um, Ukraine? But long before this war, there was a war going on in um, uh, um, I, I've forgotten now the name of the country. Just just next door to um, to uh, to Saudi Arabia. Um, is it Sudan and Yemen? Su and... Ye Yemen, Yemen, Yemen was what I was thinking of. Sudan has also been going on for a long time. So wars, uh, I don't think there, I doubt if there was ever a time in human history when there were not wars of one kind or another in one corner of the world. 
Um, so this is all a part of life. It's, um, warfare, disease, accidents. Um, what to do? I mean, even in times of peace, people die in horrible car accidents. Um, so war is just one among the many causes of death. So if, if we want to follow the path of Advaita, we need to be realistic about the nature of samsara, the nature of embodied existence. So all these things, when we see these, these we should take as reminders, such is the nature of their life. What happened to these people could equally well happen to me. So before, before this death comes to me, let me try and find out what is real, what is eternal, who am I? I hope that's an adequate answer to that question, to the extent there can be an adequate answer, because ultimately uh, this, uh, this life, this is just the nature of life. Yes, I think it was, um, I think it was a very appropriate answer. Um, it's just a reminder, really, what you were saying, because there has been so much uh, uh, coverage of the Ukraine-Russia war, and there's yeah. been a lot of gods and demons, uh, the sort of a duality has been set up, uh, and yeah. I think it has made yeah. it much more stark for people, uh, that, uh, you know, that wars, like everything else, are a product of various causes and conditions, and it's, and I think this, uh, that there's a tendency to just blame, you know, to, you know, to have that egoistic yeah. self rising, when it's me and what I identify with that is, yeah. you know, that's under attack. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, when it's somebody who I don't like who's under attack, then I can ignore mm. that and it's not very important. Yeah. I yeah, don't yeah. feel that. So I think this is, uh, unfortunately, well, this is the human condition, it seems. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, um, the next one. Um, yeah, the next question is, uh, when observing I, it seems to subside into life force energy. What is the next step? Because it seems to be like nothing there, like I is gone and there is a spacious state. But the proof that ego or ignorance has not gone is that it comes back and all identifications with doer, pleasure and pain uh, will also return. So what is the next step when ego seems to subside? All these things, the idea that ego subsides in the life force, in whose view is that? It is only in the view of ego. Uh, no. <laughs> no, it's not a, uh, Atma means, well, Atma simply means oneself. So is it Atma? as ego or Atma as we actually are. So it's it's only all the all experiences, all impressions are only in the view of ego. So our aim is to attend only to ourself. So the idea that ego has subsided in the life force, what is this life force? It's just some other thing that is Ego can only be only if ego truly subsides, it can subside only in our being. Because what what remains in the absence of ego is only being. There is no life force in the absence of ego. The life force seems to exist only in the view of of uh, of ego. When ego subsides in sleep, what remains? just being, I am, that's, that's all that remains in the absence of ego. Everything else, including this idea of a life force, exists only in the view of ego. So if ego actually subsides, of course there'll be nothing to do, because who is to do it? I mean, ego is the doer. When the doer subsides, to ask what is to be done is, is meaningless. The whole purpose of Atmavichara is to bring about the subsidence of ego in being. In other words, the cessation of all doing and what, what remains when all doing, including the doer, subsides, is pure being. And, and even to say um, ego subsides in, in life force or whatever it is, whatever we say, there's an I that is aware of that. To say there's no I there, it's wrong because who is experiencing whatever we experience 
the experiencer of it is I. So the I that experiences anything that changes is ego. So, so long as there's an I that can report this happened or that happened or this was experienced, that was experienced, that I is ego. So it hasn't subsided. So we need to turn our attention back towards that I. Only when our attention is fixed only on that I will it subside completely. The next question is, uh, as we know, the ashram magazine Mountain Path contains a lot of articles on other gurus and texts. Why would the ashram magazine devote so much space to other teachings? <laughs> Why should they not just focus on Bhagwan's teachings? Maybe sixty to seventy, maybe sixty to seventy percent of the articles there are not directly related to Bhagwan's teaching. I I am the wrong person to ask <laughs> because um, I I mean I can ask the same question. Um, I think people don't really understand the greatness of Bhagavan. Bhagavan is something unique. Yes, we have all due respect to all all other great souls, but Bhagavan is something beyond all this. What Bhagavan has brought us is something so immeasurably deep, so immeasurably precious. Bhagavan cannot be compared with anything. It's only when we look outwards that Bhagavan is, a, is one among so many gurus. But Bhagavan is our own being. Bhagavan is that which is shiny in the heart, in our heart, as, as our fundamental awareness I am. Bhagavan himself, when he was asked, whether he's an incarnation of this God or that God or which God was he an incarnation of, he wrote a verse in which he said, Arunachala Ramana is Paramatma, but exists blissfully uh, as awareness in the cave of the heart lotus of all different jivas, beginning with Hari. Hari means Lord Vishnu. So from, from the highest God down to the smallest ant, that which is shining as the awareness I am in the heart of all of them, that is Arunachal Ramana. If we really understand that, that Bhagavan is it's something so much greater. That is, he took on a human form, Lord Arunachal Shiva himself, took on a human form in order to give us these teachings to turn us back within. But what Bhagavan actually is, what was shining in that human form, is something infinitely greater than that human form. Bhagavan is the infinite whole. He is the one, the one without a second. Ekameva Dvitiyam. He is our own real nature, the thing, one thing that actually exists. So, Yes, we, of course we have love for his outward name and form, but we need to understand that he is in no way limited by that outward name and form. That is just a, an a, outward appearance that he took on in order to turn our attention back within. So he is, he is the one thing that actually exists. So how can you compare the one thing that actually exists with anything else? So because people don't really understand Bhagavan. They don't really understand his teachings. They don't understand what he is all about. So they're interested in this guru and that guru and all these things. It's nice entertainment. And yes, we okay, we have respect for all these. There are so many great souls, great Mahatmas and so on. But Bhagavan is beyond all these. That which is shining in the heart of every jiva, from the worst sinner to the greatest saint, from the lowest uh, um, insect to the highest god, that which is shining in the heart of all sentient beings, that fundamental awareness I am, which is shining in the hearts of all, as all, that is Bhagavan. So if we understand the greatness of Bhagavan, we will not be interested in all these other things. Other things will lose their appeal. But we, this isn't to criticize because not everyone is is yet um, that that is people so many are, are attracted to Bhagavan, but not all who are attracted to Bhagavan 
understand his even begin to understand his real greatness. We, of course, we can't say we have understood the real greatness of Bhagavan, but at least we have an inkling that his greatness is something greater than our mind can possibly imagine. So, um, yeah, it, 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 I, I, I understand the spirit with which the question is asked. It does, for those of us who are wholly devoted to Bhagavan and to what Bhagavan taught us, it does seem inappropriate, but it appeals to others, so who are we to, who are we to criticize it? Next question. Jury, can, can I just add one thing? This, this mountain path was started in 1962 or something, about 12 years after Bhagavan left the body. It's been running for a remarkably long time. But um, even during Bhagavan's lifetime, there were attempts to start a magazine. Some, some rich devotees even offered the ashram a donation, a, a large sum of money to finance the, the production of a magazine. Um, but people in those days, they felt they had to get Bhagavan's approval. So they asked Bhagavan, they said, uh, Bhagavan, wouldn't it be a good idea if we have a, an ashram magazine? Bhagavan said, what's the need for all the uh, magazine? There's all these books are there. There's Nana and everything. That's, that's sufficient. And then someone said, um, uh, but Bhagavan, all other, uh, all, all other, um, institutions had their magazines, the, the Ramakrishna Mission had their own magazine, Other, this organization has this magazine, this organization has uh, this magazine, so shouldn't we also have a magazine? Bhagavan simply said, Aduvera Bari, that's a different way. So starting a magazine is not really Bhagavan's way. Bhagavan's way and they called it the mountain path. A mountain path suggests something very steep and difficult to climb. But Bhagavan's path is not a mountain path. It is the easy path. It's about subsiding, sinking back into our heart and being like, a, like the water in a river being swept to the ocean. If we enter Bhagavan's path, we are swept by the current of his grace down to the ocean of, uh, of immortal bliss. So Bhagavan's path is the very opposite of a mountain path. To this, Bhagavan's path is a, a path of subsidence, and to the extent to which we subside, our life is very easy. Uh, our life may seem difficult, but that is because we haven't subsided. If we truly subside, if we're truly following Bhagavan's path, it is the easiest of all paths. So the analogy of a, a mountain path is quite inappropriate for Bhagavan's teachings. But anyway, all these things happen. These things are inevitable. It's, um, there are all types of devoted people have all types of interests. And so these things are inevitable, but um, uh, this isn't really Bhagavan's way. Says me, who's been contributing articles to the mountain path for so many years. <laughs> So these things happen as they're meant to happen. Next question is, can we be benefited by learning Tamil if done with the intention to deepen our knowledge of Bhagwan's teachings? Can being able to understand Bhagwan's words in his own language increase our love to put his teachings into practice? Understanding the words can't be a substitute for our practice. But works like Arunachala Akshar Manamalai, where his unconditional love and devotion towards Arunachala is expressed so beautifully, can understanding verses like these in the original language help us to increase our love, to surrender ourselves? In your case, do you think that knowing Tamil has played a role in your own path in some way? I guess if one is able to learn Tamil, that that comes also with destiny, and God would give us the skill to learn the language. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I would say definitely knowing Tamil is a is a great blessing. I don't my my knowledge of Tamil is far from perfect, but to the extent to which I have I have learned Tamil, and I um, 
I learned Tamil primarily to understand Bhagavan's teachings. I never set about learning Tamil systematically, but because I was interested in Bhagavan's works, um, from the early days I was helping Sadhuam doing translations and I was slowly, slowly picking up Tamil. Later on, after Sadhuam left the body, it became necessary for me to um, begin conversing in Tamil, which I had never really done before. So I also learned some conversational Tamil, a lot of which I have, and my, my Tamil as far as conversing in Tamil is very rusty now. But my as time goes on, my understanding of Bhagavan's poetry and his writings, because I'm focused on that so much, that my understanding of it is deepening. And it's definitely a very great um, benefit. But um, it's, it it's not an easy language to learn. It requires a lot of effort. So um, I think each of us have to ask ourselves whether we consider it worth it, um, because it does require a lot of effort. Ultimately, um, what's most important is putting Bhagavan's putting Bhagavan's teachings into practice. But understanding Bhagavan's uh, teachings in his own words, as he himself expressed it, it definitely gives us a greater appreciation of the depth and subtlety of his teachings. And also, um, it also can help to, um, to increase our love for him. As, you, as, as the person who asked these questions said, uh, works like Arunachas Duti Panchakam, Bhagavan has poured his whole heart into, this, uh, into those verses. So understanding those verses in the original it somehow brings us closer to uh, Bhagavan. So it, it is a great blessing, but it may not be um, appropriate for everyone, because it, obviously it requires a lot of effort to learn a, a new language, particularly if you're not living in a country where that language is spoken. Um, and the truth is, actually, there are many Tamil devotees, devotees who speak um, and read and write Tamil, they find it very difficult to understand Bhagavan's Tamil because they haven't, uh, they have, they are not familiar with the, uh, with literary Tamil, the Tamil, the, the, the poetic language in which Bhagavan was, wrote these works. Um, so, for any any such Tamilian, I would strongly recommend it's worth trying to understand Bhagavan's works because they're not so difficult. It's just you have to become familiar with it. But for someone for whom Tamil is a completely alien language, um, it's quite a, it is, in my case, it just happened because I happened to be living in Tiruvannamalai. I, I, because of my interest in this, because I happened to be with Sadhuam, I, I have picked up Tamil um, slowly over the years. Um, but to someone for whom it's a completely new undertaking, all I can say is if you feel prompted by Bhagavan, do so. If you don't feel prompted, no need. I mean, Bhagavan's, Bhagavan is in the heart of all of us. Ultimately, Bhagavan's, Bhagavan's teaching in words is pointing us towards his real teaching, which is what is always shiny in our heart, silent as our own silent being. That is, Bhagavan's often said, silence is the real teaching. So the, the, the teaching in words is only pointing us inwards to find the real silent teaching in our own heart. So the, the bulk of our effort should be directed towards turning within. If we also like to learn the, the language, then it is certainly very beneficial. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say to anyone, oh, you have to learn. That that would be a, a misleading statement. It's, it's, if it is meant to be, it will, it, you, you will feel drawn to it, and uh, you will study it, and you'll learn it, and you'll begin to appreciate Bhagavan's Tamil writings more. But it's not necessarily for everyone. We can still understand Bhagavan's teachings, we can still follow his path, even if we don't know Tamil. Um, but it's very useful to have good translations, if that is the case. Unfortunately, many of the translations are far from 
satisfactory. Um, yeah, so uh, anyway, I hope I've answered that question adequately. Does the self have will or is it completely impersonal? When you say that Bhagwan will make the body, mind and speech do what it's destined to do, to me that implies that the formless reality has intention. Could you please clarify? The nature that is our real nature, Abhmasarupa, what, what, what we actually are, is pure being, Sat, pure awareness, Chit, pure happiness, Ananda, and pure love. Um, a, an alternative term for Sat Chit Ananda is Asti Bhati Priyam. Asti means being. Bhati means shining, that's awareness. Priyam means love. So uh, that is love and happiness. Uh, as Bhagavan said um, uh, in, in, the, in the first sentence of Nana, since happiness alone is the cause of love. So happiness and love go hand in hand. So our real nature is infinite love, but it's not personal love because in, in the view of Bhagavan, who is our real nature, he doesn't see us as anything other than himself. Because he sees us as himself, he loves us as himself. So his love is what we experience as his grace. So Bhagavan isn't doing anything, he's just being as he is. In the 15th paragraph of Nana, Bhagavan uses a very beautiful term. He talks about the the panchakritiyas, the five divine functions, that is creation, sustenance, uh, dissolution, uh, veiling, and grace. He says all these five happen, isan sanidana visesha matratal. That means by the special, by the mere special nature of the presence of God. The presence of God means his being. So, God is not doing anything. He's just being as he is. But by his being as he is, everything is happening as it used, as it's meant to happen. So when it is said that Bhagavan or God has allotted to us the fruits of our karma, it is true in a sense, but that doesn't mean he's not sitting up, scratching up, sitting up in heaven, scratching his head, thinking, which karma shall I give to this person? Which karma? Uh, obviously not. He's just being as he is. And by his being as he is, by being the infinite ocean of love that he is, everything happens as it's meant to happen. That one Parameshwara Shakti, which is that infinite love that he actually is, is driving all karyas, making everything happen as it's meant to happen. So, um, yes, oft, often the way it's expressed, it does sound somehow dualistic as if there's a God out there who is who is ordaining all these things, but we need to get, I mean, because it, it has to be expressed somehow in words, it is expressed in words, but we need to, by understanding Bhagavan's teachings correctly, we will understand all these things in the proper perspective. So he is doing all these things without doing anything, by just being as he is, He's doing everything. That's what Bhagavan called doing without doing, knowing without knowing. That he, everything is just happening by the mere power of his grace, which is the infinite love that he has for us as himself. Because he is our own real nature. He is what we actually are. He is our true self. So he loves us as himself. I hope that is an adequate answer to that question. The next question. Uh, do the terms Chit Abhasa and uh, Sutta Rivu mean the same thing? Yes. Chit Abhasa is a Sanskrit term. Uh, abhasa means uh, a likeness or a semblance. It also means a reflection, because if you look in a mirror and see your reflection, you're not actually, the reflection is not actually you're not seeing your face, you're seeing a likeness of your face. So, but the basic meaning of Abhasa in that context is a likeness of awareness. So it is not 
real awareness, it is a semblance of awareness. Um, and th that semblance of awareness is what is called ego. This is this is a Sanskrit term. In Tamil, Bhagavan used the term suttarivu, which basically means, um, suttu means uh, indicating or pointing out, so the, the, or showing. So the awareness that shows, in other words, the awareness that shows all this phenomena, that is suttarivu. The pure awareness that we actually are, the Suddha Chaitanya, as it's called in Sanskrit, is what Bhagavan calls in Tamil Sutatraribu, which means uh, a, awareness that is devoid of pointing out or showing. Uh, so, yes, Sutaribu and Chidabhasa mean exactly uh, that is the, 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 the precise meaning of the word is, uh, is different, but the, the, they're both referring to the same thing. Namely, the, the limited ego, but sorry, the limited awareness that has risen as ego. The next question is, uh, was Bhagwan the first to place a firm spotlight on the subject, the unchanging I in our first person experience? It doesn't seem that the older scriptures directly pointed towards just hum in the way Bhagwan has done. Uh, yes, I think that um, there, that is, if we understand Bhagavan correctly, he has clarified, that is, we can understand the old texts far more clearly if we understand them in the light of Bhagavan's teachings. So many things, we, in the light of Bhagavan's teachings, we can see how things were indirectly implied in the older texts. But people fail to understand that. So Bhagavan has clarified things a lot. For example, one thing that Bhagavan has made very, very clear, um, it, it is generally said in, in, in Advaita, in classical Advaita, that the root cause of all problems is avidya, ignorance. And the solution for avidya is vidya, um, which it means knowledge. What is the knowledge that will remove avidya? Many people don't understand. They think you have to study all the all the the, the prasthana tray of Upanishads, Bhag, Brahma Sutra, Bhagavad Gita, and the commentaries on them, and so many other texts, and that's how you gain knowledge. But the the knowledge that will remove e e e e self ignorance is not book knowledge. That's just conceptual knowledge. The, the vidya, the knowledge that will remove the, the, this uh, primal ignorance is only the awareness of ourselves as we actually are. But regarding avidya, among the in, in classical Advaita, there was a there were there were two two major schools. The um this is in post uh, Shankara, among the followers of Shankara, there were two major schools. These weren't the only schools, but they were two of major schools, which was the Bhamati school and the Vivarana school. And they disagreed on many interpretations of what Shankara had said. One of the problems that they uh, considered is what is the locus of avidya? That is, what is the, 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 uh, the vishaya of ignorance that is what we are ignorant of is ourself. But what is the asraya, the place, the, the locus of uh, ignorance? In other words, who is it who is ignorant? According to one school, the, the, it must be Brahman, because ignorance comes first and jiva comes afterwards. So you, so the, the ignorance must be for Brahman. According to the other school, no, Brahman cannot be ignorant. It can only be, the locus of ignorance can only be jiva. It's only, the ignorance is only for jiva. Um, so all these sort of things were, so many confusions were there, things that weren't clear. Bhagavan has made it very clear. There's no such thing as ignorance other than ego. That is, what is called avidya, ignorance, is not actually ignorant. It is a wrong knowledge. That is, ignorance is the opposite of knowledge. The true knowledge is the pure awareness I am. That is ever shining. 
So there's no opposite of that pure awareness. So what is called ignorance is the wrong knowledge. That is, instead of being aware of ourselves as just I am, which is the truth, we are aware of ourselves as I am this body. So this this that which is aware of itself as I am this body, namely ego, is itself a vidya. So, uh, so the ignorance is nothing but ego. Ego is one who has ignorance, and the ignorance is the very nature of ego. So, e so this is far more practical because otherwise, if ignorance is something other than ourself, we we are. Uh, if it's something other than ourselves, when we're looking for some solution outside ourselves, the problem is outside ourselves, some ignorance, and how do we get rid of this? Whereas Bhagavan made it clear that avidya is nothing but ourself as ego. So in order to get rid of avidya, we need to get rid of ego. Um, so, and what Bhagavan explained about the nature of ego, for example, what he explained in verse 25 of Uludunapadu, but the nature of ego is to rise. Ego itself is a formless demon or phantom. The nature of ego is to rise. So, so because it's formless, it's got no form of its own. But its nature is to come into existence, to stand and to flourish, grasping form. He said, grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes abundantly. Leaving form, it grasps form. Since it itself is formless, whatever forms it grasps is something other than itself. And how does it grasp them? Because it's formless, how can it grasp the form? It hasn't got any hands or, uh, to, or arms to grasp. It grasps in its awareness. So, the nature of ego is to be always grasping form. But if, in, if instead of grasping form, if we as ego try to grasp ourselves, in other words, if we instead of allowing our attention to go outwards towards other things, if we turn our attention back within and try to hold on to ourselves, to our own being, tedinal otumpidicum, if thought it takes flight, that is the nature of ego which rises, stands, and flourishes by attending to other things, it will subside by attending to itself. This is an invaluable uh, uh, clue that Bhagavan has given us, an invaluable truth he has revealed to us, but to the best of my knowledge has not been revealed anywhere else. And also, what is the relationship between the pure awareness I am and ego? It, very simple. The pure awareness I am is what is real. Ego is that. It's, ego is not a second eye, but not two eyes. But a real eye and a, a unreal eye, a big eye and a small eye. There's only one eye. When that ego is that which is aware of itself as I am this body. So in that adjunct conflated awareness, I am this body. I am is the reality. The body is uh, is what is, is is unreal. It's an adjunct. So, in order to know ourselves as we actually are, all we have to do is to see ourselves without adjuncts, as Bhagavan says in verse um, twenty-five of Uludunapadu. Seeing oneself without adjuncts is itself seeing God, uh, because God shines as oneself. So, what what we and God are one in substance. What makes us seem different, this is what he says in verse 24, what makes us seem different to God is the, is the adjuncts that we now identify ourselves with as I am this body. This body is an adjunct. So in ego, there is a real element and an unreal element. This is indirectly implied in the scriptures, in the older texts, in classical Advaita, but describes ego as chit jadagranti. Chit means the pure awareness, that is, I am. Jada means what is insentient, that is, the body. And granti means not. So the not that is formed by the entanglement of chit and jada is ego. Of course, chit itself is never entangled. Chit is ever un unaffected by, pure, pure awareness is never affected by these things. But in the view of ego, the awareness and the uh, it seems to be conflated with this this fundamental awareness I am, which alone is real, seems to be conflated with the body. 
So there are so many ways in which Bhagavan has simplified and clarified the basic philosophy of uh, Advaita. So if we have understood Bhagavan's teachings correctly, we will be able to understand all the old teachings in a, a much clearer perspective. And we will also be able to recognize that different teachings, as Bhagavan said, different teachings are appropriate for different for people at different stages of spiritual development. So in Advaita, there are many different levels of explanation. So the level of explanation that Bhagavan has given is the deepest and subtlest and the most practical. But in, a, in, in, in the old text, you'll find so many explanations, which in the light of Bhagavan's teachings are absolutely redundant. But why those explanations were given is that they were appropriate to people at certain level of spiritual um, spiritual development. So when we talk of classical Advaita, there isn't just one classical Advaita. There, within classical Advaita, there are many different levels of understanding. Many different levels of explanation are given to suit people of different levels of understanding. But Bhagavan's is the deepest and the most practical of all. So Bhagavan has clarified Advaita uh, like never before. I hope that adequately answers that question. Next question. Uh, what does God is love mean? And there's a sort of, and there's another question is attached to it that, that since this is the centenary of Muruganar uh, coming to Bhagwan, may we have a dedicated session to Muruganar? <laughs> um, uh, session dedicated to Murugana, Murugana dedicated himself wholly to Bhagavan. So if we understand Murugana's complete dedication to Bhagavan, dedicating our sessions, every session to Bhagavan, is how Murugana would like us to dedicate. Because he was, uh, were, that is, Murugana had lost himself completely in Bhagavan. So to understand the greatness of Murugana, we need to understand his complete surrender to Bhagavan. He had, he had lost himself in Bhagavan. So he, there is, truly speaking, no Murugana other than Bhagavan. So in talking about Bhagavan, we're dedicating, uh, we're dedicating ourselves to Murugana, as Murugana would want us to dedicate ourselves to him. Um, sorry, what was the first part of the question? I've forgotten now. Yeah, the question was, uh, what does God is love mean? Oh, God is love, yes. Um, there's a saying in Tamil, I mean, it, even in the Bible, I think it is said, in the Gospels, it is said, God is love. Um, some Christians say, oh, only in Christianity do we say God is love. That is shows their ignorance of other things. In, in, in Tamil, one of the... Um, there's a saying, Anbe Shivam, love alone is Shiva. That is the very nature of Shiva, of God, is love. And Bhagavan has implied the same in so many places. For example, in one verse of Akshram Lai, Ambu Vilalipol, Amburu Vunilene, Anbai Kare Taralaranachala. This is the most beautiful prayer. This is verse 101 of Akshram Lai. The meaning of this prayer is, like ice in water, melt me as love in you, the form of love. So he refers to Arunacha as the form of love. In other words, Arunacha is love itself. It's a very embodiment of love. And in Patika, Arunacha Patikam, there's a verse that begins, Amburu Varunachala, Arunachala, the form of love. So love is the real nature of God. Uh, love and God are inseparable. And God is our own real nature, so our own real nature is love. Um, more than this, if we we cannot understand more than this without under, without knowing for ourselves what is God and what is love. Since God is that which is shining in our heart as our own being, our very being is love. So to know what love really is, 
and how love is and God are one, we need to know ourselves. So the deeper we go in this path of self-investigation and self-surrender, the, the more meaningful this term, God is love, will become to us. Otherwise, it's just empty words, but uh, that is to really understand the meaning of these words, we can understand it by only, only by looking deep within ourselves. Otherwise, we are just, that is, the, the words God is love, Ambe Shivam, love alone is God, is we can understand with our mind, we can understand the, the meaning of this to a certain extent, but to understand it fully, we need to lose ourselves in that infinite ocean of love that is God. We need to melt like, uh, like ice in water, we need to melt as love in God who is the form of love, in Arunachal who is the form of love. And Arunachal and Bhagavan, of course, are one and the same. So Bhagavan is the very embodiment of love. He, he is love manifest in human form. But the human form is not Bhagavan. He is, the love that is manifest in that human form is Bhagavan. The infinite ocean of love. There's a question from Bruce. Uh, it, it says, uh, the attachment to drama is like a self-cutting person. The gross visible suffering acts as a proof of bodily reality. Yes. Yeah, so what, yeah, go ahead. Michael, you yeah, no, you say, you say, you say. No, that. you say it, you say it, you go. <laughs> I was just going to say, life is a drama. Life, so long as we are attached to this body, we we are caught up in this drama of life. So our aim in following this path of self-investigation and self-surrender is to separate ourselves from this person whose life is such a drama. But so, we also create the drama. By allowing our mind to go outward, yes, yes. Right. So if we want to be free of drama, we need to turn back and subside, turn within and subside back into the heart. If we rise as ego, samsara is a huge drama. Not a very, well, it may have little pleasant things here and there, but most drama is strife. You watch any uh, drama on television or something, there's so many uh, films that are classified as drama, there are so many uh, soap operas that are classified as dramas. They are constant strife, constant problems. And that people find entertaining, <laughs> God alone knows why, as if our own problems are not enough, we want to entertain ourselves with the fictional problems of others. So um yeah but that if, that's it's the the attachment uh to the vishaya vasanas uh is creates uh the uh separation from the real self yeah and, it's not even we can't even say attachment to a vishaya vasana the vishaya vasanas are the seeds that give rise to all attachments all desires attachments likes dislikes and so on Right. So the analogy I was making in terms of self-harming is that the self-harming seems more real because we can see it and touch it. You know, it's like the famous doubting Thomas, you know, the, the apostle that wouldn't believe that Christ had risen from the dead, you know, because and he had to put his hand into the actual wounds yeah you know before before he could yeah. actually believe you know yeah i don't know I, it's a very gory and graphic but uh it's it's like the attachment to these things you know it's like uh it's just a distraction is what i'm getting at all vishayas are a distraction but what is actually distracting us is not the vishayas vishayas means phenomena what is actually distracting us is not the vishayas themselves, but our vishaya vasanas, our inclination to take interest in all these vishayas. So if is, we, it, if we is there a, to... it, what about the fear of like, 
like it's one thing to be afraid of a snake right yeah but what about being afraid of the rope i don't understand that uh, well what, what i guess what i'm that? what i'm saying is is that like like the the snake is animated and we could we can justify a fear of it yeah. right because it is animated right yeah. in our mind yes now the rope is not animated right yeah the rope is is insentient yeah that pure insentience it is like it it rests in the face of uh it rests in the face of the, of the ego like you know and it it's like a threat that is a threat you I don't know if that I think I maybe I'm I'm, I'm not sure but I think maybe I understand what you're saying that is not the it's not the snake and the rope actually but it's what they what they are analogous to the snake is al analogous to all this multiplicity that causes us so much trouble the rope is analogous to the underlying reality our own being what we should be afraid of is all this multiplicity but actually we are so attached to this multiplicity we are afraid of subsiding into the un underlying reality which is what we actually are we don't want to let go is that perhaps what you mean that's that's uh that's approaching yeah 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 that's, yeah. that's uh, yeah. But... yeah but one thing we shouldn't be afraid of which is our own being we are afraid of because we <laughs> don't want the to one let thing go. yeah 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 exactly but what what do you do like because it's like it's like spinning your wheels in sand or something uh because <laughs> though you recognize that the 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 snake is not real the prospect of that unreality <laughs> that you know i mean i guess because of attachment and investment in that attachment we, we do not recognize it <laughs> but the snake is unreal so long as we see the, the the rope as a snake the snake is very real we right. oh that that is someone told me the other day but some particular person was had said but uh death is an illusion therefore we need not be afraid of it that is wrong because yes death is an illusion but illusion is what is unreal but seems perfectly real so it's perfectly logical to be afraid of death because death appears to be us to be so real simply being told it's an illusion is not going to remove our fear of death because the fact is so long as we take ourselves to be this body the death of this body is something very real to us and so inevitably we will fear it so merely merely understanding conceptually that all this is an illusion doesn't solve the problem when we are told all of this this appearance of multiplicity is an illusion that is to try that is to help us to detach ourselves from from this in other words we because it's all a delusion we need not an illusion we need not be concerned about it what is the underlying reality of this illusion is our own being i am so to, to encourage us to turn within that we are told all this is an illusion but though it is an illusion it will continue to seem to us real until we see the underlying reality which is ourself as we actually are right but so like the boy what? that's walking in the forest at night at dusk right like yeah. the boy who's walking in the forest and he's with his father and the father uh or the boy sees the stump of a tree and it's in the moonlight and it's he's you know afraid that it's a ghost right yeah and i i get i get the analogy uh you know and and so the father 
teaches him, you know, that, that, uh, that, you know, it's, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's this ghost can't hurt you. And then he goes to another, his teacher at school and is walking with the teacher, I guess, the next night. And the teacher shows him or he sees the tree and the boy explains, you know, the story, you will explain it better. Uh, but I guess what I'm getting at is, is okay. So the, I find it frightening the facing the reality of the delusion that I have been under. Because we are still attached to the delu delusion. Well, it's crumbling away. Let's just put yes, it that right. way. So you, you were saying what to do, and you referred to wheels spinning in sand. The only thing we can do, we are now caught up in this illusion. So yeah. in order to extricate ourselves from this, we slowly need to wean ourselves off our concern for this. So it's only by attaching ourselves to what we actually are, namely our own being, but we can slowly wean our mind off its, its concern about all these things. Okay, so you made an analogy earlier in, the, in your discussion about that Bhagavan's path is not the mountain path because yeah. it's down it's downhill as opposed to uphill yeah right now if, in if my we are following it correctly if we are yeah. really surrendering ourselves to him we'll be swept to the ocean like a like a, a raindrop that has fallen in a river so in in my deluded existence mm. i once had a dream where i saw a, a woman running up the mount a mountain right yeah. And and I said to myself, that's the about the only thing will that will get me to the top of that hill. Mm. Right. So my, but my point is, is that if in the, if I interpret that story, that dream, <laughs> uh, you know, desire in general is something that I'm chasing after. Right. And I'm chasing up that hill. But it's a, it's a mistake on my part yeah that i should not be chasing that desire to get to the top of the mountain because that's reflective of doing and yeah. it's also of identification yeah. so i i so anyways if yeah i don't know if that's we 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 need to stop running after anything other than ourselves <laughs> Running after anything other than ourselves is the path of pravritti. That means going outwards, activity and everything. Bhagavan's path is the path of nibriti. That's the path of withdrawal. So by turning with him more and more, we slowly sink back into we sink back into the very depth of our heart, and thereby we separate ourselves from all these things. So ultimately, Bhagavan's path of self-investigation and self-surrender. This is the only solution to all these problems. This is the only way to wean ourselves off all our desires, attachments, likes, dislikes, hopes, fears, and so on. Um, Michael, yes. um, we've had a reasonably long session today. Uh, yes. We we're going to make it a bit shorter. Right. There were two smaller questions, but I think they can actually wait till next time. If they're short questions, let's just... Let's okay. just uh, so uh, the first disappoint one is, anyone. All right. So the first question is, is the term pragna aparada, which means mistake of the intellect, pointing to this wrong belief of the ego? Yes. The intellect is that is an instrument of ego. The intellect is what by that instrument by which we discern, we distinguish, we uh, discriminate. So now we have we have wrongly discerned, we have wrongly, uh, we, we wrongly take ourselves to be this person, this, this body. So this is a, an error of judgment, we can say. This, this error of judgment is nothing but ego. 
So the very nature of ego is to always mistake itself to be a body. Um, so I assume that's what is meant by that term. The term itself, I've heard the term, but I'm not so familiar with it. Thanks, Michael. Uh, the last question, uh, could it happen that you introduce the teachings of Bhagwan to someone and that someone goes on to follow his teaching diligently and as a result realizes his true nature, while at the same time you who introduced uh, him or her to the teaching have not? In other words, can someone else attain enlightenment separately from oneself? If, if not, what is the point of explaining Bhagwan's teachings to others? <clears throat> that is, so long as we're looking outwards, there seem to be, we, we, we mistake ourselves to be a person. We as ego mistake ourselves to be a person. So when we look outwards, we see many people. So since we as ego mistake ourselves to be a person, we mistake every person to be an ego. So in every person, there seems to be, every person seems to be a sentient being. There seems to be something in that person that is knowing all of this. So when we are looking outwards, there seems to be a multiplicity of jivas. So yes, from that, from that perspective in which there seem to be a multiplicity of jivas, it is quite possible if you explain something to someone, they might actually catch it better than you do and put it into practice and, and, um, and attain liberation. But that's all true only so long as we're looking outwards and we see the appearance of multiplicity. In order to turn within, what Bhagavan has taught us is Ekajiva Vada. There is actually only one jiva, one ego. And who is that? Who is the one who is seeing all this? That is, the one jiva is the dreamer. The dreamer is the one who is seeing the dream. So the, the dreamer knows, uh, yes, I, I am seeing all this. So we need to, the, the one who, to whom all this appears, needs to turn its attention back within to investigate who am I, this one jiva, in whose view there seem to be so many other jivas. So ultimately, the, the, the deeper truth is that there is only one, one uh, jiva, so only one liberation is there. But even deeper than that, if we actually investigate who am I, this one jiva, we will find actually there's no jiva at all. Jiva means ego. We seem to be ego only so long as we're looking outwards. When we look back within, there's no such thing as ego to be found. So Ekajiva Vada, taught by Bhagavan, is an interim teaching. It's not the ultimate truth. The ultimate truth is there's no jiva at all. But uh, in order to turn our attention back within, we are taught that though there seem to be many jivas, all those many jivas exist in the view of the one jiva you now seem to be. So investigate this one jiva. If you investigate this one jiva, you will then see what you actually are. You will see that you were never a jiva. Therefore, there never were any other jivas. So there, we can talk and explain these things on, on different levels. That's what I said earlier. In Advaita, there are inevitably many different levels of explanation. Most of Advaita is explained from the perspective of Nana Jiva Vada, the multiplicity of jivas. So they use analogies like the sun is one, but if you've got lots of pots of water, in each pot of water, there seems to be a reflection of the sun. So every pot of water is, is one separate jiva, but it's all a reflection of the same one source. There's so many explanations are given to suit people of different levels of understanding. But the deeper truth is that all those many jivas exist in whose view? In the view of, of, of the one jiva but who is seeing them. So the one jiva who is seeing all the other jivas needs to investigate itself. Who am I, this one jiva, in whose view all these other jivas seem to exist? When we investigate ourselves, this one jiva, we will find that we were never a jiva. 
And since, since all the other jivas existed only in the view of this one jiva, there is actually no jiva at all.